Uh, next up, we have my uh, colleague and friend, uh, Glenn Berseth. Glenn is an assistant professor at the University of Montreal. He's a Mila core member, a CIFAR AI chair, and he's co-director of the Robotics and Embodied AI Lab. And uh, he's going to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is robot learning or embodied AI. Yeah. Take it away, Glenn. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much, Liam. All right. How's everyone doing this morning? Excited for your last day? You've learned so much this week. I'm hoping there's still a little bit of space left for me to try and put some more information into your brain for this morning. And you've had some good carbs from the bagels from this morning to help that happen. Okay, so yeah, today, yeah, I've got a particular interest in, you know, seeing what I need to do in order to get most of the algorithms you've talked about from this week to work on like real applications, real world hardware. And if there are changes in theory or basically from a very depth perspective, what needs to be done in order to make those things really happen and where those limitations are with current methods. So we'll be talking a lot about basically those concepts today. And also, you know, I'm a little bit more, make this more of a discussion. Please feel free to ask questions during this at any time. I left room for at least 30 minutes of questions. I'm joking. So there's plenty of time, but please feel free to ask questions. So. So I'll be talking a bit about today, really a lot about like what's needed to get RL working. And I'm gonna be going over what I've kind of came up with yesterday is thinking about this in kind of three different aspects. We really wanna be able to reuse stuff really well. If you train some model, it's like the whole paradigm for computer vision, this should be a useful model that someone can use later. So how can we also embed this into the way we're training agents with RL as well? We're using even just a version of goal conditioning. Um, a way to recycle things. I'll talk about more what I mean by this, but we have a lot of data out there. How can we use it in even more applications so we can have more access to them? And in many ways, you know, people often hear that reinforcement learning is incredibly data inefficient. Uh, maybe I can try and at least make you, you know, convince you a little bit that's not entirely true. It might be other things, but not entirely data inefficient. And I'll talk about sort of these reasons down here about why that might be less true. Okay, so let's talk about these different three R's. So you've got reduce. We really wanna reduce the amount of data that's gonna be needed, maybe by using different priors or you can use different computer vision models. But I'm gonna talk more about what's becoming really useful these days, which is offline reinforcement learning as a good way to be able to kind of like reduce the extra amount of data that every agent needs to learn. And then the reuse part, I'll talk more about specifically for goal conditioned RL. It's just a way to talk about this concept. Like you train a model and now you have some other conditioning variable and hopefully you can use this other places. But what does this really mean? We'll go into some more of those details. And then this recycle part, which is something I've been particularly interested in for the last two years is quite literally how much can I recycle data almost that was never meant to be used for this particular thing but can I still make some useful bits out of this, gather some of the useful bits of information and reuse that? Okay, well, then a little bit of a side, I do some other work in autonomous kind of RL, safe RL systems design, obviously things related to robotics, but I won't be discussing those today. There's just not enough time to cover my entire class in one hour. I'm gonna do as best as I can for maybe more of the stuff that hasn't been covered in the summer school already. And this is a, an example of some of my kind of like more recent work where I try to get like a system to train from scratch. There wasn't any pre-training at all on this robot hardware. We just stuck it in this room, told it to start trying to collect stuff, collect data and collect things. And it learns how to clean up your room over time, entirely trained from vision. No extra data, no vision models needed. Okay, so then how do you change the page? Pause. All right. I guess I'll be a bit more careful playing videos from now on. Okay, so it's a little bit about what's wrong with this assumption when we're applying reinforcement learning to the real world. We basically are doing this process. Where we've got some policy. It's going to sorry introduce basically some distribution of how the agent is going to act in the world. This can be incredibly long and complicated over time. And in the end, we're always just trying to maximize this reward objective for reinforcement learning. It's the thing that, you know, as a roboticist, I try to tell my robot, you know, this is the thing I want you to do. 
This is the behavior I want you to be able to come up with. Please don't do anything else, although that tends to happen very often. So we wanna maybe get better at this, but this talk is a little less about this part and more about dealing with these other problems in reinforcement learning, where we might have to worry about, you know, having really long tasks. You know, if you've got something related to cooking, cooking is a pretty long task, many different steps, many different things you have to interact with. Um, and you need to be able to learn a policy for this whole thing. And if we're just rolling out individual policy distributions for like 40 minutes, and then trying to back propagate all this information back into the policy, it's going to be incredibly sample inefficient. And there's also this area for novel and sparse rewards, which I talked about for a bit. So in some ways, I don't really want to have to craft this reward function in a very specific way. I just want to say, okay, go and solve the world's problems. I'm going to go to the pool right now. If you could do that, that'd be great instead, because I like swimming. So we really want to be able to push forward on that part of the problem too. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So when we're talking about this part, you know, like learning long tasks, so one of the really helpful pieces is thinking about the fact that there is a lot of composition in the world, and we really want to find ways to take advantage of this. So you can have one giant policy, but when you have really long horizon tasks, it either causes credit assignment problems, and it makes just general exploration and planning very difficult. So can we at least break up this problem into smaller problems? So like, for example, Cooking soup is a very compositional problem. So, you know, like, how many people like to cook? You know, good time, good break from work. Definitely can't interact with your computer while you're trying to cook, which is a good way to, like a good pastime. So then you should know a bit about like cooking soup in this case. You're gonna end up gathering a bunch of vegetables. So even now, like just gathering things from the fridge or wherever is one task you're gonna do repeatedly, even if you're going for different items. You go to cut some vegetables, but you can cut onions. You can also cut carrots, a number of other things. If you're more familiar with like, you know, dicing things, julienning things, there are even classifications of way to chop things. So these are not, in some sense, very different tasks, even though you might be interacting with a slightly different object each time. But there is a lot of reuse in the overall policy structure that the agent needs to, you know, use in order to solve these tasks. So you instead, though, you could just train like one policy for every single one of these tasks, you know, train one policy. This is the cutting carrots policy and a different policy for cutting onions. The problem is, is you end up with this giant set of policies. There's not very much reuse between all of these. So instead, you want to be able to train these, you know, in a couple of different ways. So we've already talked a little bit about why this is a bad thing. So basically, we're not getting any of this reuse even though there's a lot of similar structure. So I'm gonna talk about, all right, how can we start to take advantage and at least develop a policy training structure that will take, you know, adv you know, take advantage of some of this reuse, some additional structure and composition that's inside of these tasks. So maybe I'll just put this down since I tend to be standing here the entire time. Can everyone still hear me? Good, perfect, thank you. Okay, so instead of having a set of policies, Let's just think of it this way, simple way. All right, now we've got one policy. Let's just introduce a context. In the case where we're cutting vegetables, this could be the description of, you know, something that says it's a carrot versus an onion or something like that. Otherwise, most of your cutting is still pretty much the same and you can reuse that policy that you've learned. So in practice, when we've been doing this more in machine learning lately, we do this in a fairly simple way in just this first example where you could think of, we're literally just gonna make like a one hot vector. There's a bunch of zeros in this, there's a one that's gonna indicate this is the task you're going to do. So basically when your policy has some input and it's gonna have some image and then some input that's C, and then these are the things that are gonna go into your network now. You've added this additional context. And the idea is now this neural network will encapsulate a lot of the other similar shared information implicitly inside of this network. So this is good. Now we don't have to train a bunch of individual policies. This will probably also save us time and the things we need to train. Okay, so then the real part that becomes complex is what if we start to have tasks that overlap? So we could train a bunch of these um, in different ways, maybe get a couple of them, but you know, it was really easy when I just told you, okay, we've got a different task for cutting carrots versus cutting onions. Onions and the vegetable is literally how you're chopping out, or sorry, separating the different tasks, just trying not to use the word cutting or any other kitchen terms in this sentence. So it's less confusing. 
So let's look at this navigation example instead. This one helps see some of the problems with this composition. So if we're gonna you know, start out at zero here, one, two, three, four, about five, you know, in navigation, you kind of want to say like, go to X, go to this X, Y location, you know, even somewhere inside of this room. And if we were gonna use this context approach up here, it means that basically, okay, I need to have now a context for, if I were to chop this up and discretize it into a hundred different spaces, my context is now length 100. And it's not making very good use of even like the bits of information that you can use in this context. So we wanna know, can we do better? Like even inside of this space. So what if we actually, you know, separate our context here? So instead of having, you know, one, one hot vector for a hundred spaces, you could technically, you know, split this up into two different context vectors, one for going to X, one for going to Y. And now you can train a policy that'll hopefully understand how to interpret or sorry, interpolate the different contexts they use now. And now you don't need to train your policy on every one of the 100 contexts that were in this before. Hopefully you can train them on some sparse combination of these different contexts for X and Y. And now you'd be able to locate each other in the room. Does this make sense? Any questions so far? Pretty good. All right, fantastic. So in this case, you can still do okay. So this is already helping. We come up with a slightly better representation. You can still, the policy can learn that there is a kind of like a cross product representation between these two contexts to help you represent where the true goal is. And that you can definitely get some, um, I guess, interpolation there too. So if you just trained on like this location, this is your start. These are different goals. Ideally, if you specified a new goal in this location, now your policy can interpolate between the X's and Y's you use during training. So this is now, we talked about this very specific form of what is goal conditioned reinforcement learning. So we'll get into this case now where, all right, so what if our decomposable structure is far less obvious? You know, this is the real world. And in many ways, I've had this discussion with a few of my students and people too, is like, do tasks even exist? They do provide some useful structure for at least relearning policies. So if we can use these, it often means that the, there's not such a clear separation between one task and another task. And especially in this case where I'm just going to, you know, if we're making this cooking robot, you know, it means in this case, there's a bunch of different types of things. And, you know, I'm also got my own like bias in the background. I'm used to cooking, well, somewhat used to cooking things that are somewhat from like the Canadian cuisine. There's probably other types of cooking that are going to have more interesting and novel stuff that I'd love to learn about and be able to integrate those as well. So it's going to be not, you know, you can't make a perfect controller and you want to be able to add more of this diversity and extra additional bits into it as well. So the real kind of next step in this building on that is instead of having just sort of this conditioning one hot variable. Basically, we're kind of now moving from this discrete space now into the continuous space where you've got a goal and it's less clear in how to represent what this goal is. So you can have goals of all sorts of things. You can still give locations, but instead of having this grid, I'm gonna give you like the GPS location of where to go inside of this room. That could be a goal description. And there's a lot of new work, which I'll get into here where it's more like, you know, I give you a picture of somewhere inside of this room and you have to figure out, okay, where is this picture representing that location and also how to go to there. Technically two different problems. One is this goal representation problem of taking that picture, understanding what it actually means. It's really like, what am I trying to tell the robot to do? Which is a different kind of separate problem for inferring the reward. And then trying to train the policy to understand if I give you this representation, that's a picture now, you need to know what this goal is and how to actually get to that goal. Slight variation on the problem. So this is, you know, so if you were to train, you know, some stuff where we really want to get this generalization between goals. And if we're doing this in the discrete space, the theory is nice, but you don't always get as easy and nice generalization and reuse, where you can just have like this interpolation where if you train over a bunch of separate goals, where you basically, cover most of this grid, then you should have a policy, thanks to a lot of the features that basically come along with deep networks. The fact that we have a parameterized model 
means that we can hope with some good proper some good properties that there should be some interpolative behavior between the different goals that you can specify. If there isn't, well, you're definitely paddling up the wrong river and you should probably maybe make your network smaller or you're gonna need to sample this goal space more and more. Ideally, we don't wanna to have to sample this goal space a lot. You know, We wanna be able to have you know, versions of learning systems that are as smart as people. You've already all been in this room a couple of times. I'm sure if I gave you just a few example goals, I probably don't even have to anymore. You can find your location in this room now without having to need much more data. So that's sort of the, uh, that's the ideal place we're trying to get to with really good learning systems. So then when we get down to this, one of the additional benefits is, you know, being able to train on this sparse set. And there's a lot of algorithms basically that are designed to figure out what are the best set of goals to sample amongst this space such that you get like this much, you know, performance out of your policy. It's actually somewhat even related to some of the robust RL discussion from the last talk. You know, how can you actually learn an MVP that's going to cover your space well enough to get this amount of performance? So this is, you know, helpful. I'm not going to talk as much about that in this, though. Instead, we're going to go back to this. Okay, we're going to do goal conditioned RL, and we really want to do it from images because, you know, I don't want to have to specify a particular goal space. The internet and world is full of images. They're nice and cheap. And if I can just give you this image, then hopefully you can just tell our robot, please achieve this. So we're gonna switch a little bit where for this goal conditioned RL from images, it's literally like, all right, I want you to, in this case, set the table. Here's an image of my table. Hopefully it was you know, like clean at one point in my life and I can take an image of that and now save that very carefully and I can give that to my robot whenever I want the robot to reconfigure the state of my apartment to look like that one again. However, the problem now is when you're getting into images is it was really easy to determine what the context was from before. You know, like if you end up, if you're the robot and you walk around and you end up within the grid point that I said you should go to, great, you get a reward of one. That's pretty easy to define. But now if I give you an image or at least, you know, like a robot in this case and say like, please go and make the world like this. How is it going to determine that it's successfully achieved making the world look like this? It's a lot of the like more challenging part, but now we're basically going to try, we'll talk about being able to train some image representations now where we can now still compute distances inside of images. So the part though that still becomes tricky for being able to learn this is now you basically, instead of having a context from before, so before in our policy distribution, we just had actions and observations. Now you have a goal that we're gonna give the agent. So this is additional input that we're gonna condition the policy on. And now we also have to worry about the environment should be giving us some distribution of goals. Like these are the tasks that we want the agent to be able to learn how to perform. And then our dynamics will normally stay the same, but for this particular problem, let's just assume the goal stays the same for the entire episode. Nothing too complicated where we're gonna change this over time and then our dynamics get more confusing. Even this is a hard enough problem to talk about for today. So now I was mentioning that our reward function now depends on this goal. It's not just our action and our observation. There's this additional bit of information that's gonna tell us, okay, you could be in this location, but it's conditioned on whether or not, you know, Glenn told you to go over to the corner and grab him a bagel, or if he told you to just go over there, sit in the corner and don't make any noise and your reward function will be different. Sorry. So when we're doing the some of the simpler versions of goal conditioned RL, where you've got a goal, and this is the part when we're not doing images. Let's just say you've got a robot, it looks just like me, and I want it to just go into a particular pose at a particular time, and then I can just specify that state as the goal. And now I can just make my reward function look exactly like this pose, please do that thing. And for the moment, this works really well for goal conditioned RL, but when we get into images, we really don't have access to the state anymore. And the goal is also an image, which isn't really a complete way to determine what the state is either. So it's very difficult to be able to use this type of distance as a reward function here without any additional information. So the problem is really, now that we have observations, Distances inside of the space of pixels don't really make sense. 
you know, I can kind of show you an image of a couple of things, but if you're just computing things inside of pixels, it can get kind of weird in how we're actually talking about the task. So let's talk about like what we, like this issue that I mean, where it's like just using pixels is not a very good idea. So you can have, you know, the image is already a huge number of parameters and you can have small or large changes. Yeah. So three images. Hmm. Okay, so if you have like a 3D image or a voxelization of your whole world, it solves one, I guess, problem where you're still here inside of like, you got all of your state information here, but you still have an extremely high dimensional piece of state information. And the thing is, is there's a lot of things about the world and they, the way they might change that are gonna be unrelated to the reward function. So I'll go like still with this example here where the change in the pixels or even like the voxels in this case might not be really meaningful for the task. And we're trying to mostly use this for the reward function right now. So one example for this is you can just think about the background noise. So like in this image here, we don't really care about the fact that there's a green sheet over the background of this. It's mostly so that you can't see all the students in the background and that we know that if things change in the background, it messes up our computer vision pipeline. So in this case, like even if some of the voxels change, they're not actually related to the reward function or voxels or pixels. And this, I can give this example too. So if I take, you know, this puck and the idea was for the robot to move the puck, if the puck changes color, does that really change anything about what I'm asking the robot to do? Not really. So I wouldn't, so that means in the distances that we really want to compute, we really don't want them to change at all if the color of the puck changes. It's still the same distance if you move the puck in this case. And it's like, it's more of an object uh, centric idea that we really want to describe the environment in. So this will help in the representation quite a bit and ideally make your state space, your true task related state space much smaller. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it doesn't know that quite wet. So the question is, yeah, is there a reward function specifically for this type of goal? So I mentioned it vaguely here, just that at least the reward function is going to depend on this goal. And we're trying to find a nice way to be able to determine the distances now for this function. Before we could just, you don't want to just literally take the difference between the pixels in one image or the other, because you're going to get probably Basically, you're going to not be telling the robot in this case in more detail exactly what you want. You'll tell it vaguely maybe something related to what you want. But in my somewhat painful experience, it'll often explore a bunch of stuff that's unrelated to what you really want. And then you'll want to do more stuff like this so that the only option for it to do is what you're really asking it for. Great. Oh, my. Okay. Oh, perfect. So I'll just maybe skip to this slide that rendered properly. So then one way to be able to train a representation that's useful for this space is you can use a variational autoencoder. So the idea, um, one of the ideas behind like using a variational autoencoder is you can take some representation. In this case, images, it might have more information than what you need. And if we think more specifically about the example for we're just training like an MNIST model, it means you're taking in an image that I think is like 27 by 27. But your data set actually only represents 10 bits, the numbers between zero and nine, which means that this representation here for Z, if you do a really good job, should basically just capture the representation for the numbers zero through nine. That's what's going to describe your state. I'd much rather condition my policy on the numbers zero through nine than all of the pixels that's, I think, somewhere in the hundreds or near thousands for the whole number for the picture. And then you can condition you know, the model a little bit better and it's like, I don't know, make the board read the number three and the robot can go draw that on the board, something like that. So this means in this space, we should have a much better representation um, that we can use to compute distances. Even if we've got voxel data too, you can use this as well. It'll probably take longer to train, um, of course, but then just like use this overall model as one way to start to be able to get these distance models. And what you can use from this after then is after you train this, just take the encoder part here that ends up producing these Zs from the variational model 
And now you can take your goal image and the image your robot sees and just compare the distance inside the latent space between these two. And this in practice works pretty well with the one asterisk or caveat um, or that it might take a little while to, you know, tune your VAE such that you do get a good representation in this latent space. Oftentimes, a lot of the machine learning models tend to focus on how good the reconstruction is, which is a bit unfortunate because my life always tends to revolve around is how good is your latent space, this Z vector you truly trained. And often we don't actually have supervised information about telling me whether or not that thing's good or not. So this is my partly been a pain point in my research for a while, but I've gotten pretty good at training models that have an accurate enough um, latent representation to be useful. Okay, so you can use that model. There's still a couple of like weird catches. Yes, go ahead. Um, Yeah, if you know that beforehand. So the question is, you know, do we, if you know something that there's going to be some invariances in the data set, you should go about introducing those most likely into like this latent space. There's a lot of good recent work that does like hierarchical variational autoencoders. They tend to encode these invariances in a good and slightly more flexible way. So I would start with those as a way to introduce some of these because oftentimes these invariances are a bit compositional as well. So it's a good way, way to go by like ordering them. So look at some of those models. They also produce fantastic images and you can introduce them in structure pretty well. Great. Um, all right. So there's still kind of one bit of a problem with using part of this model is also that we wanted to be able to give the model goals. And in some cases, one, one of the nice things you can do actually, so if you were to like train a model on a bunch of images of a robot moving around in this room, now you can also use the second decoder part of the VAE to generate images of places in the room that you can now you tell the robot to go to. So you can automate the whole goal decision process during training as well. And this almost works. Well, it works really well, but in real life, it has at least one interesting corner case. Darn. So in this case, what's going to end up happening is there's two different models. And what was trained hmm, is a different version of this that's called, hmm, oh, well. So there's, OK, I won't touch anything. It's finally rendering properly. So the problem with basically just taking from some like any distribution and saying that we want to be able to train a model and now using it to generate goals for the agent is that sometimes the configuration for the agent might not match exactly what was in that data set from before. So I'll give one example, which is a real common one. So like if you were gonna train the robot that's gonna be able to cook a meal, and the problem is now you're gonna train this robot over cooking any meal in the world, but you're only gonna set out the actual like ingredients to cook, I don't know, pizza or something like that. And now you're gonna sample a goal for it to perform and it's going to sample a goal for, I don't know, making japchae. That just happened to be what I cooked last week. So in this case, like the environment is not even configured. This is in some way an invalid goal to give the agent right now. So then a better way to be able to generate these goals to give the agent to learn from is at least condition it on like, really in this case, the first image of the um, episode. So like give it a little image of what it has in front of it. And then it can at least produce a set of possible you know, recipe goals that use the ingredients that are set out for it. And this is what is done in this work. We basically just take the VAE, condition it on this first image from the actual environment. So you can see, like we put one of these blocks in front of it, then we generate a goal location and it'll generate a bunch of different locations for these objects instead. And we can train it that way. And this is helpful because we can't just, you know, put every single item here in a bin and have the robot move all of them. It's better if it has more contextual information about what to generate and what it can actually interact with in its goals. Yeah, that makes sense. Great. Uh, okay, so 
So we use a bit of an information bottleneck. You can look into this as well to help make sure that the right information stays inside of the latent distribution for goal generation and the latent distribution for like ignoring the rest of what's in the trajectory. Feel free to look into those details later. Oh, and so a short practical note on using these models, which I'll go through a bit quick, but really, and I mentioned a bit already, what we actually feed to the policy in most of these cases is the encoded value from the VAE encoder. So instead of having your policy also now learn a whole new thing in image space, you might as well reuse your encoder from your VAE. Saves you a lot of time, works really well. Okay. However, okay, so I've, unfortunately, I convinced you all that images are a great representation to use for telling robots what to do things. One of the really weird issues with using images is they tend to really over-specify things. So maybe I'll zoom in a bit here. So if this was, you know, someone's room, not mine, I swear, mine is much more clean than that, somewhat often, and you give it this goal here, all right, cool, make the room clean. So there's this really weird corner case, literally in this image, that you're not sure if you told this robot this thing, but there's a window here in the back of the room. Did you also just tell the robot to try and like, basically reverse time in the universe, set the rest of the world back to this configuration that it was outside in that window. We did, that's what we said. When we trained the representation, we gave it this image. It's not what we meant, hopefully, um, and a robot would probably have a really hard time doing that. But this means images are good for some things, but in many cases, the, one of the challenges with goal condition RL is we really over constrain the problem to tell it to do things we never really meant for it to do. and. So we want to avoid some of these challenges in different ways. So one, and we also wanted to generalize better to novel goals. So I given this example, like this only works if I also have an example of my room clean at some point. I would also like, I'm sure we would all like a machine learning system where I don't even have to provide an image of my room being clean ever. I can just say, cool, go clean my room. Whatever that means, I should figure out and understand the concepts for that. And now I can hopefully just, benefit from other people that clean the room at some point and train a robot for that. And I don't have to provide this image. So this is where, great. There are some advantages. We can condition now instead on text, instead of on images. And this is becoming a really useful concept lately for robotics. The fact that we have really large language models, they capture a pretty good representation of what is meant by the text so that we can use these models in place of particular representations for goals. The one caveat though, is it does get more complex to specify rewards now. Now, what does it mean when it actually gets you a snack properly or it cleans the room? So mostly we've had to collect a bit more data and actually have people around to say, okay, you actually achieved the sentence that I specified for you. So we have to have some people label this data. So we're making a bit of a trade-off here though, to have this more flexible representation means we need other type of data for the reward function. So then why does this work? So I mentioned it a bit, like these large language models, they're trained over these huge collections of data for text. So they have a pretty good representation. And now instead of over-specifying the task, for better or worse, it's under-specifying the task. And maybe, who knows, people might ask you to clean your room or you've got roommates and you say like, please go clean this thing. Everyone in the room here probably has a slightly different level for what they consider a room being clean. So there's a bit of issues with saying, you know, having an underspecified task now means that essentially you've also possibly made it easier to do maybe a little too easy to make it consider that we've solved these tasks. So that's a slightly like different problem where it's good that we're getting these good representations. There's a little less clarity on whether or not it's as actually solved the task we specified it to do, and now we're just collecting more data from humans. And we've got this difference in opinion about what a clean room means. Okay, and there's also this second part, which is becoming more of a thing now when we apply these, when we actually want them to perform things in the world, the, these large text models don't have what's called grounding, which means that, you know, if, there might be the concept that there's a cup inside of a language model, but what does it literally mean to bring someone a cup? There's like a physical interaction there. And in some ways, if you don't have a lot of connection between the grounding and some 
something else like a cup, you might get really weird things. So a couple of you, I mean, actually a bunch of you have different kinds of cups in front of you. So what if the like robot mistakes a particular object for not really being a cup? How do you define a cup? It's kind of like a vessel that hopefully holds liquid kind of well. So you run into these kind of disconnected parts between what is the actual physical thing and what the grounding means in the representation. But for now, it's still good to at least have these symbols to specify them as goals. The agent can hopefully go out and learn how to interact with these things. And you can give it, you know, like a one or a zero, depending on whether or not it achieved getting you a cup or cleaning your room. And the part that's kind of the more recent research right now is to figure out how to integrate language models and these image-based models together. Because if you tell it to go get a cup, maybe you can at least give it a picture of the cup or something as well. But also the robot needs feedback on how well it's doing when it goes to interact with things. So if you just give it a goal, it also needs some other information to go and figure out in the world to understand how far it is away from that text goal. So it needs more visual information. So that's why there's this great work that came out really recently called Perceiver Actor, where it's doing this combination. So there is a text part for the goal. There's also a voxel decoder in this case to try to describe what the entire scene is. And from here, now that we've got this good combination, the robot can both act understanding what the goal is inside of the entire same network model and can make connections basically to what's being used inside of this visual representation. It's some really neat work where even you can look at it, like you can give the model a goal and it'll show you like the affordance inside of the voxels on where, you know, where does this sentence likely mean that you want to interact with these objects in the world? So it's matching now this better grounding between the sentence structure and what exists in the world and pre predicting most likely the robot should interact with these objects because they're related to the grounding for that particular text. So this has been some recent great work that can go in that area. You can look for that too. And then, so that can work for solving some of this grounding and multimodal issue. So now I'm going to transition a bit more, a little quickly, and kind of the next problem that has a lot more to do with how to get this to work in the real world when we really don't have enough data. So we can collect data across a number of tasks and use this. So one of the things that these large language models have also taught us is the great abundant, like usefulness of having a lot of data. And then the robotics kind of group is at least not necessarily struggling with this, but it's a lot more expensive to collect the equal amount of data on real robot hardware. But still one of the ways to get through this is Google had some recent work called the robotics transformer, or if you can train this a robot model across a bunch of different tasks, you'll also start to get better generalization. This is also linked to some other text models, but it's showing that this paradigm that if we keep at least collecting more diverse data, more tasks, you can get a better model of generalized to other tasks. So this is a large kind of area of research. It's working well for robotics. We just need to find more and more clever ways to collect data that's diverse and it's still pretty cheap to collect the data. Okay, so a real question is, okay, if it still works for robotics, where are we gonna get this data from? Okay, so one version of this is what I'm gonna call recycling. And it's an area where we maybe we can train a model that essentially can generalize across a bunch of different robots. So it seems to be a bit missing here, but there are actually already is a lot of robots out in the world. You know, there's a couple of 10 million different self-driving cars out there. There's actually a couple of million different drones. There's about 5 million different robot arms in operation right now doing stuff in different manufacturing plants. A lot of people have Roombas. So there's actually a lot of data collection going on out there all across a bunch of different robots though, which is part of the challenge. But to start with, can we even train a model that can make use of all of this data such that, you know, it's kind of the idea of where you can think of the concept where if I were to train a robot, you know, just this robot arm to learn how to you know pour a cup of tea and train a different robot that can learn how to walk across the room we should be able to combine the policy that's just pouring tea with the walking robot so it can walk over to the corner and pour some tea there isn't really a large difference between these two i should be able to combine them kind of like the same way you'd make a software api when you're trying to figure out how to combine the different functions you partly just need to figure out how to make sure you can learn a good api between all these different robots 
So this is nice for two reasons. You can hopefully get generalization across robots and it should increase the data you have now access to for robotics applications, at least by an order of magnitude. And then you can spend your evenings like me trying to talk to robotics companies to give you some access to the robot data. And then you can start to train larger models as well. Okay, so then one recent example of this, that's part of some of the research I've done is um, a method called Animorph. So in this case, the idea is to do this quite literally. And if you're familiar with robotics or you've done some RL simulations in Majoko, there's always this really annoying file in the background you can ignore called the URDF file. It describes more or less the at least kind of dynamics of the actual robot. And they're incredibly difficult and irritating to create and very difficult to get to be right so that your robot does what you want and doesn't explode inside of the simulation. So you could go about training a model that would, you know, give me an image of the robot, produce like the URDF file, and then you can train a model that can do that. Um, long story short, I'm way too lazy to do that. I'd like much easier, more automated systems. So in this case, basically we trained a transformer model here where we can feed in the state tokens beforehand. And now if we train it over about 50 different robots and we just tokenize all of its state variables, it can learn to infer what the morphology is after we train over a number of different robots in this case. And then from this, we also start to get a lot of generalization. So here we've got a model that can also like take extra data from additional robots, but it also helps even increase the performance of the actual model. So if we're thinking of the problem of, okay, we wanna train a policy that can control 50 different robots and the sample efficiency of that problem, now, if we can train a model more implicitly that can understand now the dynamics between all the robots, because in the real world, our physics doesn't really change. Let's ignore quantum stuff in this room, if you don't mind. Such that, you know, when you start to combine different robots, they still all have really the same fundamental dynamics that they're going to condition their model on. It's just trying to infer how you've wired this robot together. So we get a lot of performance improvements, I think. Yeah, we're the orange line here. Um, in terms of being able to train things faster. I believe, no, sorry, ours is the blue line, my mistake. So in this case, we get a lot of sample efficiency even during training, just because we're gaining some of that shared knowledge from all of the other robots that we're training this across. So this, this is that recycling idea. Now I'm working on making sure this works in more of an offline RL case. Okay, yes. Yes, yeah, so so this is, I'm not exactly sure what you meant by like the computation being cached, but this is definitely a version of doing the contextual part. I'm just also trying to make the whole like policy model infer the context implicitly by itself internally to the model. So I don't even need to specify it now. I'm just gonna give it the data that it should need to be able to infer what the context is. Yeah, happy to. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, I'll go, you know, we got the last part here as well to get into this. So the problem is, you know, reinforcement learning can be very often talked about it being very data hungry. And I'm going to at least, we want to still be able in reinforcement learning to get a lot of the great advantages that we get in supervised learning, which is mostly, you know, we can train from some fixed data set and everything converges and is nice and stable, which hasn't been true for like deep reinforcement learning in particular for a very long time. Okay, and I wanted to say this is not, this part of the talk has nothing to do with exploration. It's really just about if you have a fixed chunk of data, can you extract information as well as basically people can, or even better, you know, because I like to set the bar high. So I like to look at this, if anyone remembers, you know, Lacan's cake, where he was complaining that RL really only gets a really small signal at the top of this. So this is really asking between these two different questions is what I want to talk about. Is RL really data hungry or sample inefficient, or is it really just data wasteful in the fact that we haven't figured out a good way yet for it to be able to like digest and gather every single useful bit out of every data point that it does collect? 
So we want to figure out how can we make it absorb and make use of this data better. So supervised learning is good at this. I'm going to at least say for now, like, I wish DeepRL could overfit. That would be a nice property, but instead it just diverges and explodes with, except, with a few exceptions I'll talk about now. So the problem is though, like for on policy learning, you might get to use your data points like maybe 10 times before you get to off policy. And now your important sampling ratio just says no, and it starts to diverge. Um, off policy methods, you know, can start to like theoretically work in this area, but it's because they're supposed to be able to learn with possibly from data from other policies, but often they tend to diverge a lot more as soon as we start to use data that's more off policy, even for these models. So then we want to figure out how can we get the most from basically every single example of data that we collect. So I'm going to look at this from the point of view of experience replay, which is really, you know, kind of a simple idea you've probably talked about hopefully earlier in this week, or if you've collected some batch of data already and you add it to your data set, you want to replay this in your memory. So you just keep around some buffer. Then you just want to be able to sample this data from this batch and be able to train your policy this way. And then what our goal here really is, if we want to talk about it algorithmically, is we want to be able to make this K, you know, as large as possible. Can we just do experience memory and replay it over and over and over, and we still don't diverge and we still get a very good policy? This would be like, I'd like to be able to have overfitting work properly for RL, and I'll worry about the other issues, but we can't even get this far yet. Okay. so. So we have basically these different problems. We're on policy. There's a bunch of algorithms, but you can only use data that's currently from the policy you used to generate it. Model-based methods can be good because they're often based on this supervised learning paradigm, but they have some other challenges for RL, which I'll talk about in a second. And off-policy methods should be able to work. They kind of are trained from a version of supervised learning with little asterisks where there's some bootstrapping in there. And your Q function you can learn, but it's also conditioned on a policy for your Q function. So it makes your life a little more challenging. So I'm going to go right into this, what's called offline or batch reinforcement learning, depending on which side of this country you're from, uh, or at least continent. So model-based RL can work, and it doesn't often, like it shouldn't diverge. The problem is, is it's challenging to make it plan for really long horizons. And if you there's also a another kind of different theoretical challenge where there isn't a very good like monotonic improvement theory for re model-based reinforcement learning. So if your model becomes more accurate, it doesn't imply that you're going to get better rewards, which is not a good property for the way we want to be able to train models. So instead, what about doing Q learning? So functions should be able to learn stuff from other policies. The problem right now, or at least has been recently, is that these would often still diverge. If you don't, if you're using off policy data in some way, they tend to diverge for different reasons. So a lot of this is related to a concept called the deadly triad, which was introduced by a colleague, uh, Van Assault, which basically says that we combine for deep learning, bootstrapping, function approximation, which is the deep learning part, and off policy learning, this just leads to divergence. You can get away with combining two of these and your life is still okay and things don't diverge. But once you put in the third one, now your life is a real problem, which is unfortunate because the combination of these three is usually when we get like the largest, best useful models. So then you can think about this slightly new paradigm for offline reinforcement learning, where before we would just like train a model online, it collects some data, it learns from that data. Now we're going to do this process entirely offline. You're going to train an agent over some bit of data you've collected already. Hopefully there's some good stuff in there and then apply this agent in the real world. And our goal is, is we want to be able to like train this agent to be the best it can be, even from this offline data. The same way we do more stuff for supervised learning, like learn to predict the best stuff from there. So then how can we get this to work? So this causes divergence and let's look at why. It's because one way to look at this is that there's some distribution problems and that there's basically a mismatch. So something at some point gave you this data set that has all of this data, hopefully some of it's good. The problem is, is you never have access to the policy that was used to collect that data. And where this starts to become an issue 
is now you're going to construct a Q function and a Q function gives you Q values depending on some assumption for a policy. And now if you never have access to the policy that used to collect the data, you're going to have to make some other assumption that actually it's going to act according to some policy that was never really used to collect data in the real world. And this is going to cause at least a couple of different problems. One is that, you know, you're going to have a model that's going to think it's going to do great, but because of this distribution mismatch, it's going to actually do really terrible in the world because it's still thinking that, you know, when it takes actions and makes mistakes, it's going to follow this distribution, but actually it has its whole own policy that's never really collected data, it has a lot of different problems. So this has a lot to do with overconfidence in the model. And a lot of this is related to support. You know, where is our support in this case? So if we look at, we actually have data for this small section at some state, we got some action data. This is what's in the data set. And we want to be able to keep our model to say like, it should only really feel confident in itself inside of the area that it has data. You know, we're all scientists here. We shouldn't be coming up with giant grand conjectures about stuff we have no experience with and no idea for. We don't want our agents to do that either. So then what was done in some recent work by Avral Kumar, who's a colleague of mine, is let's be conservative. In this case, let's introduce a regularization term basically here that if we're gonna try and predict for Q values for actions that aren't in our support, we should just basically squash Q values that are outside of what we actually have data for. So in this case, you're basically saying just be conservative. And this can work really well. It's a nice you know, version of a method now to be able to add on some small constraint, not too difficult to work with. There's an extra hyperparameter or two. And now we can at least make sure that the Q values that we train, these functions can still work and they shouldn't be you know, over assuming or getting overconfident in areas that has no data, which can happen again, because we're using function approximation. So anything outside of our support, all bets are off. Your Q function can predict pretty much anything it wants out there, and that's not what we want to happen. So I know that was a bit quick. So is there any questions about the, I guess, this objective so far? Yes. Yes, that's the goal of this objective. But that means that there is an that is very good outside. Correct. It won't have any data for that. So it's assuming right now that for actions outside of its data, it doesn't have knowledge and that it's going to make a bit of this assumption that they should probably have lower Q value. You can still go collect online data later, but it's without any more data, this is the assumption it's going to make. Yeah, so sorry, that question was, um, I think I mostly explained that. If it's, it's going to assume some of the things about what's only inside of the data set. Okay, and then for the last part, um, so there's also a slightly different way to look at this problem. So you can add a constraint here, and this will be good. It'll help keep everything inside of this particular distribution. Oh, do you have a question? Please go ahead. Sorry. So how does this relate to distributional or RL? Ah, okay. So they're, they're not quite the same. So distributional RL is also trying to figure out, okay, really our world is not... So there's a problem really with assuming that we do point estimates for most of our Q functions when really there's a lot of stochasticity in most of our outcomes and we lose all of that information in normal Q learning. And when we do distributional RL, we're trying to bring back that information that actually our outcomes are not perfectly deterministic and that it helps to model this additional information. And we lose a lot when we just do point estimates for models. And then, so in this case is different where it's, we're just trying to estimate, you can combine this, sorry. This is still a point estimate then. Um, this is still just a point estimate. So you could add distributional RL on top of this if you wanted to. Sure, thank you. Great. And then, and then so there's a, one other way you can also look at this problem. So instead of adding like this conservative constraint to squash the values of things that are outside of the data set, you can use, sorry, a type of behavior cloning. So just train a model. You've got a data set that goes from states to actions. Use this data set. You can train a simple model that'll tell you what's the probability of this action in this state according to your data set. And then you can just change your argmax and your Bellman backup a little 
bit where instead of doing the max overall actions, which gives you your overconfidence, instead use the probability from this model that's from your data set. So really only select things when you're doing this assumption from things that were likely according to your data set. It's a very similar idea. This can also work very well. And so I'm doing some more work inside of this area now. One of the challenges with this is most actually like deep learning models, they're point estimates. They don't capture multiple modes very well. So if you use a better model, maybe like a diffusion prior, a GMM, something that'll represent the distribution of actions better, you end up being able to apply this model better and getting better learning over time and a better high quality policy. Okay. So then the last thing I'll touch on is, so these were like a very RL focused aim at what the problem is for getting overconfidence. But remember, we can still look at it from the deadly triad. So function approximation was still one of the issues. So what if our function approximator just wasn't so terribly behaved? We should be able to get a better model and not have so much divergence issues. So we can look at this from the point of view of having issues there and having early overfitting. So some of my colleagues at Mila have been talking about this research lately that's been really great related to the primacy bias and avoiding overfitting. And the idea is, is there's a lot of complex network dynamics that go on when you're training a policy, especially for RL, because you're essentially getting new data all the time and your distribution changes. These aren't the issues that you have in supervised learning. So if we want to be able to avoid kind of this issue where your network will overfit data really early on, and then you can develop really kind of poor behavior in the dynamics for your network. The idea is to basically reset or prime the network. And this for the moment is introducing some inch, some more like useful behavior inside of the network dynamics that allows these models to generalize better, probably even in local areas. It's most likely introducing some better ways, a bit more for extra, extrapolation, but more likely better interpolation between the data that you already have. So in this case, if you just take like a version of SAC and you reset just like the last layer of the network, just by adding a little bit of noise to it, it's more difficult for that network to now overfit the data and become really overall confident really early on. So now if we look at it this way, you can use these resets to help condition your model better just from the whole network function approximation area. Don't even need to get into the problems about why this doesn't make sense for RL. And this still gets to the idea where they're also examining what's called the replay ratio. This is that same version where we want K to go up to infinity so that we can basically make as many passes as possible over the data that the agent collects. So this has been really helpful um, for being able to increase that replay ratio, even for online data. And that's why the SAC model can learn faster because it's actually gathering the bits from its experience like as best it can, or at least better than other algorithms. Oh, sorry. And then, yeah. And there's some, there's a follow-up to a couple more of these primacy bias papers where they're finding much better ways to be able to do this resetting, especially when getting into much larger neural network models, which would more common, those cause more divergence and reinforcement learning as well. Okay. And if you want this, I posted my slides on the Slack channel. You can look at some of the details there and some details on the algorithms. Okay. That's okay. Thank you for listening. And then that's everything my talk for today. Thank you.